Welcome to Cancer Talks, a podcast sharing stories of personal transformation and collective healing from people who have been touched by cancer. My name is Claire DeLazlo, and I'll be guiding today's conversation. Our next community workshop starts Tuesday, October 4th. The theme is Making Peace with Death. This free series will be led by Sarah Kavanaugh, a gifted facilitator on the spiritual and practical aspects of end of life. Visit cancertalks.com slash zoom to register. Our guest this week is Elena Sonino, a life coach, speaker, and yoga teacher. Elena's work is an invitation to unearth, attune to, and embody inner strength and wisdom so we can move through life with curiosity, purpose, and delight. You can find her book, Inhabit Your Joy, at elenasonino.com. Hi, Elena. Welcome to Cancer Talks. Hi, Claire. Thanks so much for having me. I thought we could start with a little reflection on how cancer is showing up for you and, and touching your life this week. Hmm, this week, how cancer is touching me this week is this idea of strength and what it looks like and what it doesn't look like. I've been thinking a lot about this because one of the threads that I think I learned or one of the ways of being that I learned over 24 years ago now when I was first diagnosed with my Hodgkin's lymphoma was that I had to be strong (laughs) and strong looked like kind of doing things myself and I wasn't a particularly great patient meaning I didn't allow the support of others very easily (laughs) Mm -hmm. and All of these years later, as I've matured and experienced different things, and I'm trying to open up my receptivity, my kind of expanding my capacity to to be me, one of the things that I've realized is almost getting in my way, this idea of needing to be completely self-sufficient and only relying on me, right? Mm -hmm. It's created... Uh, perhaps some walls in relationships, even in the way I show up to do my work and how maybe I could grow my work in my own practices if I allowed myself to be more vulnerable, right? To yeah. ask, I, I talk a lot about asking for what you need and want. And yet that receptivity of it, you know, isn't something I've always been really good at. Yeah. And so this is really showing up for me and I, I connect it directly back to this journey. And, and in fact, I've been practicing really over this last week and even over this weekend, you know, just allowing myself to be softer and mm. just receiving that support that's there when I do. And it's kind of been just uh, hard, super hard, let me be honest, and really wonderful. Mm-hmm. Can you describe a moment from this weekend where you received? Yeah, I mean, a few different ways. One of the ways was even in my relationship with my husband, you know, just opening up conversations about what was feeling really important to me mm-hmm. and and softening into asking for his support, asking for his input, asking for his, asking to be seen. And it's something that, I mean, truth be told, he's probably been wanting for me for a really long time, Mm -hmm. right? For me not to have to feel like I have to do it alone. So that, you know, we we took a very long walk and had a conversation. And and so the interesting thing about it was I was able to to have this conversation where I softened my edges in a way. And I was in my body while we were having it, which I think is something that really helps. Yeah. Right, which the walking, the being outside, mm-hmm. and and it was, you know, we came out of that conversation closer. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. My girlfriend and I go on a lot of walks to process things, also. Yeah. 
And so just this idea of, I mean, look, there are places where we we get to mus- you know, flex our muscles, <laughs> right? To to be strong. But it just occurs to me, and, and even in more physically demanding things, I took my very first hoop aerial, I'm not even sure exactly what it's called, but you know, like big hula hoops yeah, that are hanging. It's called a lira, right? Uh, that it's could also be a done. Yes. <laughs> And so I took my first class yesterday. It's been something I've been wanting to do for a really long time. And a lot of strength is required there. But what's interesting is also trusting the support of the hoop, of the device, right? Of, yeah. And of the equipment and also of the mats underneath. Oh, by the way, when you fall, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? And so just, it's really been everywhere. This idea of, okay celebrating strength and allowing it to not have to be always demonstrated in the same way, right? Mm-hmm. That That's perhaps softer is an interesting access point. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, of course. And could you share for context a little bit about what your current work is? Yeah, of course. So I am a life coach. I help women connect to what they know to be true inside them, right? But maybe have stopped listening to. So I I think about it as really helping women to get rooted, curious, and fully alive in their lives. So I do that through one-on-one coaching, but really my love is to work in the container of groups because I believe in the power of groups, right? We come in as individuals, and then as we share, we learn from one another. And there's there's an energetic circle that we become a part of. And so that happens through virtual groups, but also retreats. Uh, those are really the great loves of what I do. <laughs> and, and really through a very embodied mind, body, heart, soul approach, you know, connecting. When I think about getting rooted, it's Yes, into the present. Yes, into what you know for sure, but also into the wisdom that's deep, deep inside you, right? In the body, in in the fascia, the connective tissue. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and so that's the work that I'm doing right now in the world that I am delighted and honored to get to do. And you started this work after the thick of your cancer journey. Is that mm-hmm. true? It is true. Yeah. And and even later, right there, it took a few iterations for me to get here. <laughs> yeah. What would you like to share about your path between your cancer experience and the work you're doing now? Yeah, that it all feels very connected. It's like one big connect the dots image that I haven't quite finished yet, right? Mm-hmm. Because I believe, you know, we're always becoming, but you know, I was diagnosed. Um, with my Hodgkins in my early 20s in 1997. And at that time, I thought that I most, well, there were two things I wanted in the world. One was to be a mom. And the second was to be an elementary school teacher. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And what ended up happening was, well, I got to do both. So the good news there. But I, so after my treatment, I ended up going to get my master's in education. So I taught for 12 years. And what's just funny is that through that teaching is where I first actually experienced coaching, meaning I was trained to coach my staff. Um, I was a teacher leader in the building, right? And so new teachers, struggling teachers, just are the teams of teachers that we, you know, were a part of to help create better student outcomes and really promote best practices. And then I left, so I taught for for 12 years. And during that time, right, it was kind of one thing that led to another. During that time, I had gotten married, had had my daughter, and then gotten divorced, and then was getting remarried. And as I was getting remarried, uh, it was the time when mom blogging was you know, kind Mm -hmm. of becoming a thing (laughs) in, in the old days, different than now. And 
I remember thinking that it was time to start telling the story, aka the cancer story, through mm-hmm. this lens of being a mom and kind of day in life and then getting remarried. And so I started blogging and embarking on the social media world that, you know, in 2008 and nine looked a little different. <laughs> but yeah. that that is what then led me to then lead teaching, leave teaching rather and embark on writing full time and tapping into kind of this adventure and then also wellness and aspirational kind of element of who I was. And it was during that time when I was writing and doing some different social media and digital media consulting for kind of education related things. I was doing a lot of wellness focused writing Mm -hmm. and life coaching kept coming up right? In terms of it would be something I would think about and learn about. And there I was though, newly remarried with a husband who's an engineer. We have a spreadsheet for everything. And oh so, right. So I kept putting off the idea of coaching because it was an investment to go get my certification. And, and yet it just kept coming up, but it's really, it's like one thing that led to another thing that led to another thing that, that really feels tied to A, who I've always been, what was always meant to come from me and around me. And then very much, you know, this path that my my life took with that first diagnosis and everything that I learned. Because if I think about what I learned as a patient, and it took me some years to put this together, it was that I had everything I needed and craved within me. Mm -hmm. Everything, meaning, you know, the, the stem cells that ended up being given back to me during my bone marrow transplant Mm -hmm. were my own, right? Mm -hmm. The, the daughter that I ended up having when I wasn't supposed to be able to came from me, right? When I, even in all of the doubt and all the uncertainty and all that, no, it's not possible. So to then embark on coaching to help others connect to that sense of power and possibility within themselves it's what I did as a classroom teacher with my students. It's mm-hmm. what I learned as a patient and it's now what I get to do. So, you know, it took a few years to kind of circle around to, to where I am now. And, you know, I always think we're evolving and the journey continues to reveal itself. And it is, it's the next, I think the next chapter has already begun to reveal itself. So I'm excited about that too. Mm. Well, I love that. Yeah, everything you crave is already inside you. Yeah. Really great. I'm wondering if you have a memory of cancer before your diagnosis or if there's a way that, Mm. yeah, how, how did it show up in your life or did you have some kind of baseline understanding that you carried with you into the doctor's office that day? you got Mm. diagnosed? Yeah, such a good question. I I had really had no, I mean, that sounds like a sweeping statement, but very little experience with cancer in any way, shape or form prior to my diagnosis. And all of the symptoms that I was having, I could have chalked up to anything. Right. Mm -hmm. I was living in Italy prior to my diagnosis and kind of far away from my family and then came back to the United States about four months. But all of the symptoms that I was having could have been explained by, oh, the night sweats. Yeah, I'm a hot sleeper. Right. The frequent cough that I was having and constant kind of bronchial stuff. I was a preschool teacher. I mean, three Mm -hmm. to five year olds climbed all over me and old held my hand all day long, right? And so it wasn't something that I really ever considered. And what I think I walked into that first appointment with was, it's funny now as I say this, given where we started this conversation, the the power of support. (laughs) I, I can't even, it's bewildering to me as I say that given where we started, but I had gotten engaged to someone I ended up never marrying six, Mm. seven days prior to my diagnosis. And what's fascinating about that is 
His dad was a radiologist. The family best friend was a cardiologist. My dad at that point was still, he's now retired, but was a neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. And we were sitting around our Passover Seder table when they all kind of started to look at this thing that was, had emerged at the base of my neck, right? The lymph node had become the size of a ping pong ball. And we're like, you, we're going to get you to go see somebody tomorrow. (laughs) Right. So I was exactly where I needed to be with the people that helped me move into this process in a way that, I mean, I was 23 scared out of, Actually, I'm not even sure I knew what to be scared of, mm-hmm. right? But but I was exactly where I needed to be with people that could kind of create. I was so lucky in a way, so privileged to have these people around me in a way that I didn't even know I was going to need. Mm-hmm. So, and what was different about, so we saw two different oncologists as consults and one was at Georgetown University and Georgetown is set up as a you know, teaching facility, mm-hmm. right? It's a very different and it's very, very large. And I didn't like it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but when we, when I'll just say that, when we walked into what was then Arlington Hospital, now Virginia Hospital Center, right? Um, but my, the, the, the office of the doctor who would become my oncologist he opened the door to the waiting room and he you know, says my name and I get up, but so do like six other people, <laughs> Ooh, everyone who, you know, my family and right. Because there were my parents, there was my fiance, there were, there were his parents. Um, and I remember my doctor just pausing and going, I think I'm going to need more chairs. <laughs> <laughs> and right. And so it was just, it was really this feeling of being exactly where I needed to be and surrounded by support mm-hmm. and kind of trusting, trusting that support. And the other thing that I think I knew really clearly was I had to become as much as I could lean on all that support. I also needed to immediately become my own best advocate. Mm -hmm. right and no for instance even the choice between the two doctors right whether one was like a it just like one felt right and so just advocating for that even though it meant maybe not having the big system behind me yeah what do you think gave you that resource and awareness at 23 to know that you were going to need to be empowered and advocate for yourself I mean I mean beyond being a Leo and mm-hmm. an Italian and it's just like already having a really strong personality, <laughs> totally. right? I mean, there's a lot that, of that's a good answer. <laughs> right. Like, I mean, kind of those three things, right? Being a Leo who's Italian and Jewish. I don't know that you can get more strong in personality than that. Um, but but just I think there's, you know, the thing that's always been true about me, whether I knew how to name it or not, was that there was a sense of of self and knowing inside me that in my best moments, I allow myself to listen to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I definitely at 23 couldn't have put that together, (laughs) but, but really there was almost just a sense of, okay, so here we are, let's do this thing. Mm -hmm. Um, That is very much, but that kind of goes to also, you know, it's this like push pull between the strong and the leaning on support, right? Um, yeah. I probably did a little bit more bulldozing with strength back then. Mm-hmm. And I think also to answer your question, right? I I mean, I use the term privilege really intentionally because I was super privileged, right? Here I was with a dad who was a physician, a future yeah. father-in-law who was a physician. Like I was, I was surrounded by people that could help me. And who were literally opening doors and making phone calls and 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 that also maybe there, there's the word entitled comes up in my mind. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I I kind of knew what to ask for yeah. and wasn't gonna stand for anything less. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. 
for instance, when we were at Georgetown, right? And I, we were, so we were having these consults as I was also getting staged at the time, right? All the CT scans, all the things. And my appointment was supposed to be at uh, 11 or 12 in the morning. And my CAT scan was that evening. And so I couldn't eat past a certain time of day, right? For, mm-hmm. for everything to be prepared for my CAT scan. And we had been in the wait in the room waiting for the doctor for like an hour. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and because it's a teaching facility, right? The med student comes in and then the resident comes in and the fellow uh-huh. comes in and they're asking all your medical history. And I'm watching my clock, my watch and thinking, I, I have to eat something because then I can't eat for the rest of the day. Yeah. Right. And so at a certain point I was like, enough, somebody go get me saltines. There have to be saltines. Like, I was like, what could I get in the hospital? Right. There have to be saltines. <laughs> and I, and I just remember at a certain point saying to one of these med students or residents, like enough, like just get the doctor in here. Like I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> wow. So, which could seem super entitled, but was also really just strong advocacy. Well, I really appreciate just how straight up you can be about that. And I think it's true. And it's sort of what's required to get the necessary care within the medical system. It's so easy to end up just jumping through a million hoops, even as a person with cancer living in their body where, you know, time is of the essence. It's Mm -hmm. all too common that there are these procedural slowdowns and people say, oh, sorry, we don't have anything covered by your insurance for the next six months. And, you know, something that needs to happen like tomorrow. So yeah, it is a real privilege to be in your position, but unfortunately I think it's also, it's that position from which people can actually get what they're needing. Yeah. Yeah. And that is, yeah. Yeah. And, and to then also ask, right, to, so there's the privilege and then there's the, that advocacy part of really listening to what it is. I mean, I've probably always been somebody who is self-aware and in even like body aware, mm-hmm. right, of, of how my body's feeling to the point that some things I just kind of giggle, right, of like just kind of feeling into sensations and the, the felt kind of somatic experience and like sometimes a headache is just a headache Uh (laughs) but kind of that inquiry but but really the leaning in to what it is you you need and asking questions and and not just taking things at face value right because the doctors know a lot and I'm grateful for their knowledge and it is easy to just get to consume that information and believe that we don't have any power of uh, and ability to make choices when in actuality sometimes we do yeah right I think yeah. Well, we always do well right <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and also we as the people receiving medical care we are the ones who've been living in our bodies for right. a lifetime and so we're the ones with a felt sense of quote-unquote normal or a felt sense of let's say balance um, or, you know, what it feels like to be regulated, to be your full thriving self. Yeah, Um, yeah, absolutely. And I still, right, there's, you know, as one of the things that happened as a result of all of my treatments is having, you know, a thyroid that was radiated. And so, you know, Mm. now is hypothyroid. And so, you know, it's been for many, many years, I was on the same exact dose. And, you know, we played with it at the beginning. And now over the last few years, my body, I I lost some weight and then gained some weight back and just different things. And it impacted my dosage. And it's funny, because I find myself pushing against, you know, kind of just because for many endocrinologists, it's a formula, right? You weigh this, your blood, your blood results, your your thyroid markers say this, this, this is your dose. And okay, maybe it's a starting point for information, but I, I'm, I kind of keep pushing, you know, my endocrinologist. I'm like, are we sure about this? What if we played with this? And, and it's always kind of a big question mark, right? And 
that's still a work in progress for advocacy yeah. there. But it's something that, you know, I don't, it doesn't just end when, when chemo or treatments are done. And it's something that I think we, we get to, we get to embody throughout our lives in whatever way we seek medical or, you know, medical care or attention. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All of the, the ripple effects, like that's such a relatable experience. Like, Oh I, yeah. My thyroid was radiated. So right. to have that new lifelong condition and thing to cope with, even though the cancer is gone. Right. Well, you know, that was one. And then the other one for me was, you know, I underwent my treatments when I was in my early twenties and that had an impact on all of my systems, right? Thyroid. Yes. But also, you know, not being able to have my daughter and then actually getting pregnant, but essentially because all of my systems were irregular and there were just kind of too many questions. I ended up having a hysterectomy in 2012. So, you know, but kind of as a, because there were, there were kind of questions in my cervix. And so it became, you know, how many elephants in the room do we want? Yeah. And, and because of that, and because, you know, my cycle and all of my systems had kind of been on and off again since my early twenties, fast forward to my early 40s even, and a now late 40s, almost 50, where my pelvis is not particularly a, a place that, you know, is, doesn't, doesn't look like it's my age, mm. <laughs> um, right? And doesn't act like it's my age, whatever that means exactly. And is has been a place of pain, you mm-hmm. know, truthfully. And so that became, it was really interesting to realize all these years later, I was having significant vaginal pain and that was a direct result of all of the treatments and then being menopausal at such a young age and not being yeah. able to do anything about that menopause because I had had a blood clot during my treatment. And once you have a blood clot, you get labeled a clot risk, right? Kind of wow. forever and ever and ever. And so because of that, I essentially, you know, experienced this incredible pain. And what was interesting was I went back into what I call fixing mode, right? Mm -hmm. Seeing my body as something that needed to be fixed and kind of wanting to go to war with it a little, you know, armor up, like a little bit like I probably went into that first oncological visit, right? Of Okay, like, what are we going to do? And honestly, all of that armoring up did me a disservice of seeing this part of me that's supposed to receive pleasure and, you know, be able to just be a part of our embodiment was no longer something I could access. It felt, I felt totally removed from it. Mm -hmm. And it took a long time for me to say, all right, if I weren't trying to fix this, then how can I tend to it? Right. How can I tend to this part of myself that honestly underwent trauma, Mm -hmm. right? A hysterectomy is, is trauma. And it took, you know, a pelvic floor physical therapist. (laughs) It took going to take belly dance class. Um, and to really decide, all right, what if, what if I could really just nourish and nurture and tend to this part of me as something that is alive and maybe functions a little bit differently, but instead of trying to force things on it, um, soften into that as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which so we've circled around to the subject that you initially wrote to me about. Um, when you found Cancer Talks, which is your pelvic floor. Um, Mm -hmm. You started to go into it a bit, but yeah, I would love to hear maybe a little bit more about like the first time you were able to engage with the pelvic floor in in a different way and and yeah, yeah, feel like you were on the path to reorienting to that trauma. Yeah, I mean, It was honestly, it was the very first visit with my pelvic floor PT, because prior to that visit, I had been to, you know, my gynecologist for years and years. And I was like, I I mean, I have this incredible, (laughs) the first thing that I remember, apart from the pain, but the conversation with my gynecologist was that 
you know, there's tissue in the pelvic floor, right? In the whole vaginal area, mm-hmm. there's tissue and, you know, healthy quote unquote tissue has a certain color, right? There's, there's a sense of, of fleshiness to it. Mm-hmm. That was not how he would have described <laughs> me. And, wow. um, and you might have used the word, the, the description ashen. And I was like, all right, well, that doesn't sound like a good thing. Yeah. But it was this very clinical look, right? And there were all these creams and topicals and who knows, all the things. Mm-hmm. And I ended up meeting this pelvic floor PT locally. And I went to see her. And it within minutes, she just said to me, okay, you're not crazy. And this is something that you don't have to live with, Mm -hmm. right? So there was this permission slip she was giving me to say what you're experiencing is actually like, this is, you are experiencing this because this is how your body has shown up in this moment. And what talking with her, I realized that to some degree, this kind of trauma that I was reliving every single time right, I I kind of thought about my pelvic floor was related to some degree of the hysterectomy, right? Like my womb kind of trying to protect itself. These things were taken from me. And now I'm going to go inward Mm -hmm. and not let anybody in (laughs) and right. And just kind of go into myself. And with her, I mean, the very first moment when I was like, oh, all right, maybe a different possibility exists was the breath work she had me practicing, Mm. right? And realizing that I could direct breath there, that I could, I, you know, I could send breath there and it could feel like an opening was really empowering, Mm -hmm. right? Because I'm used to, to breathing, you know, into my, all the different yogic, you know, pranayama kind of things of breathing into your belly or breathe, all all the things. Mm -hmm. But I had never thought about Okay, could I actually send energy there? And and that was really this first moment of it wasn't just a light bulb, it was suddenly the possibility, the future looked like possibility instead mm-hmm. of pain. And I got teary. Mm-hmm. Right. And that was the first. And then what's funny is, you know, you start down that path and you kind of only get so far because at that point, like there's a certain tissue kind of issue, right? Right. Like you can, you can release the muscles, you can create that, but the tissues kind of are what they are to a certain degree and they were better. And yet we started looking for, okay, well, could we address the tissues? And so she sent me to some consults. And what's funny is some of these consults and by no fault of my pelvic floor physical therapist, right. But put me directly back into that fixing mode. And Uh, I remember being Right. And, and I was like, oh, okay, no. And it was kind of like knowing that one oncologist was my doctor and one wasn't, it was the same thing, but they were all like, no, I, I just remember thinking, nope, not my person. Nope, not my person. Mm -hmm. And got myself really spun into deep into this fixing was really sad. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like I was experiencing grief all over again. Yeah. Or what I thought would never be possible, right? We're, we are humans meant to experience pleasure. And in my view, pleasure existed in certain ways, <laughs> right? And so it really, I was, it was late April, perhaps. And I had spent about six weeks really, really struggling. And I was, I remember journaling and I kind of asked myself this question of, okay, what would I do if I weren't trying to fix me? Mm-hmm. And as often does, you know, this like little whisper emerged from somewhere deep inside me and it was belly dancing. Oh my <laughs> and, <God>. I, <laughs> and I literally did exactly what both of us just did, right? Laugh out loud. Yeah. Like, what wackadoodle? Like, what? <laughs> so I wrote it down and, and I'm, you know, curiosity is one of my core values. And so I've just kind of learned like, okay, receive it, put it somewhere. I don't have to do anything about it right now. But there was just something really interesting about that. The next day I came back to my journal and I was like, huh, all right, belly dancing. Interesting. <laughs> and so I Googled, you know, belly dancing near me. <laughs> wow. And what was fascinating was there was a studio 20 minutes from my house 
that was starting a intro, you know, beginner level four week belly dancing session the following Sunday. And I went, oh, okay, in. Like I clicked on and <laughs> my mom, my mom was visiting because my daughter was in a show that weekend. And I remember like, Mad Matt, like, do you want to come belly dancing with me? And she like popped into my office with a like, what? But she did. I reached out to a friend. I'm like, hey, you want to come? She did. Oh my God. And it was the most comical thing. But what ended up happening was we walked into the studio and the instructor said, look, like, I'm going to teach you some choreography, some things. And let's be also very clear. I'm not a dancer, right? I've never considered myself a good dancer. Yeah. I love, I love kitchen dance parties, but because I can move in a way that like feels good in my body, right? It allows me to embody how I'm feeling, Yeah. not choreography. But <laughs> so she says, I'm going to teach you some things, but at the end of the day, what's most important is I want you, I want to create a space where you fall in love with your body again. And I was like, oh, right. This is why I'm here. This, this thing is why I'm here. And so I did, I took this four week class and then I think I took a few more and then summer happened, but I'm, I'm going back. Um, and it was this, it just was really, it was all about the embodiment, right? Like being this version of myself who allowed my belly and my pelvic floor and all of the parts of me to exist in a way that was uninhibited and pleasurable. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is, you know, the pelvic floor, there's a lot of, of really great work out there by so many people in terms of redefining this relationship we have with ourselves, with pleasure, with what it means to receive pleasure, to give pleasure, and to experience this feminine part of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I've been really grateful to get to dive into some of, of that work and, and still, right, it's something that I'm going to be continuing. I don't think it's something that, you know, I read a few books and I'm like, I'm all good. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Fun. But yeah, but, but it also goes then back to the other thing we started with was the, the allowing softness and not mm -hmm. having to be strong all the time, right? To allow it to look different, to feel different. So yeah, it's it's an ongoing journey, but it's this really interesting adventure that I never, I never kind of thought I was signing up for, but here we are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And finding pleasure, even when things aren't quote unquote healed, like this tissue yeah. is still different than it was when you were 19. Right. I mean, it would be different cancer or not, <laughs> you know, Correct. we change right. so much over a lifetime, but yeah. How can you find pleasure exactly where you are, even if things aren't perfect? Yeah. Right. And not having to wait. One of my mm -hmm. big things that I work a lot with my clients is right. We're always, a lot of us are always waiting for the perfect conditions, yeah. right? Or thinking that we have to, we have to fix, we have to do before we can do anything else. Mm -hmm. And, and that was really getting in the way for me to, to decide that I could heal in different ways and create intimacy in different ways. And that that was going to require of me really leaning into curiosity, right? From a perspective of, okay, like, what could I allow, right? What can I allow myself to receive? How can I nourish myself, this, this tissue in a way that isn't, I'm not trying to domineer it, right? In, in yeah. a way that is in allyship, um, instead of preparing for battle. Mm -hmm. And and what's interesting is, right, that, I mean, now, Okay, so as I get closer to 50, I'm like, well, that just feels like a much more loving way to be with myself, <laughs> right? And it's also interesting because even then starting to have conversations with my daughter, right, who turns 18 this fall. And mm -hmm. you know, these are conversations that she does not necessarily want to have with me. But just this reminder of really tuning in, becoming aware, be befriending our body. Mm -hmm. Right. And really seeing it as this ultimate source of wisdom that it can always tell us what it needs, that 
we don't have to fight it, that we, we get to listen, but we have to develop that relationship with it. Mm-hmm. In closing, I'm wondering if we could take a pause take a few pelvic floor breaths Mm. and then I'd love to hear how how your pelvic floor is doing yeah yeah I would love that So how are you in this moment in relation Mm. to your pelvic floor? I am, I think the word that comes to mind and the feeling is connected and um, like a hug is Mm. really the word. It was almost like just this very um, embraced feeling. (laughs) Beautiful. Thank you so much for your openness and softness sharing in this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Claire. It's been a delight and I really am grateful for the opportunity. Thank you for letting all of myself be be seen. Mm -hmm. If you enjoyed this conversation, please leave a review in your podcast app. Cancer Talks is a platform for anyone who has been touched by cancer. Write to us at info at cancertalks.com if you have a story to share. We hope you'll join us for this next community workshop on making peace with death. Again, visit cancertalks.com slash zoom to register. If you're moved to donate, please visit cancertalks.com slash donate.